First, I want to just share with you what our agenda is today so you know what to expect. Um, we'll begin today's session with two speakers, Rob Hayes from Indiana FFA and Kelly Kreider with Ivy Tech Academy. And um, then we're going to have Jacob Riley explain the various displays that are going on around the rooms, and you'll have an opportunity later to interact with those. Um, from about 8.40 to 9.20, students will have an opportunity to visit the displays and have a chance for a little break. Beginning at 9, we'll start our panel. Um, it'll be about a 40-minute discussion about agriculture and education. After the panelists have prepared the answered our prepared questions, we will open up for questions from the audience. And then our time together today will end at 10 a.m. But first, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Our first speaker is Rob Hayes. Rob is the Assistant Director of the Indiana FFA Association. He helps coordinate and run all state-level programs for the Indiana FFA and its nearly 12,000 members across the state. Prior to serving in this role, Rob taught agricultural education at Warsaw Community Schools for four years, and he co-advised the Warsaw FFA chapter. Rob is a graduate of Purdue University in agricultural education and served as the state FFA reporter in Indiana after high school graduation. So please give a warm welcome to Rob. All right, well, good morning. I'll just give a little point when I need the PowerPoint clicked. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be back here in Warsaw um, discussing a topic that obviously I find vitally important. As mentioned, I was one of the agriculture education teachers and FFA advisors at Warsaw Community Schools uh, prior to taking the position of assistant director of the Indiana FFA Association. So now I help kind of coordinate and run all of our state programs that students at local high schools are attending. So throughout my time today, I hope that I can impress really just the importance of agricultural education in our communities, what's really included in agricultural education, and then a little bit about where we started and kind of where we're headed in our secondary schools with agricultural education. So the challenges I think that our world faces are numerous and range greatly in magnitude. So they might be our students being unmotivated, maybe lacking some interpersonal skills or maybe some work ethic. They might be um, related to our respective industries and our own personal jobs and companies. Go ahead and click. And then one more. And it could be the major issues like ensuring that there's enough food to feed 9 billion people that will be on the planet by the year 2050. To me, each of these issues are really pretty big, but they're solved by laying down a solid foundation of skills and knowledge and attempting to really be innovative in our work. Agricultural education and FFA work hand in hand to try and slowly build those skills and teach that knowledge to students all across the country, helping them to become more effective problem solvers. So often I hear from different companies looking to hire new employees both in and out of agriculture that if someone has FFA and therefore agricultural education on their resume, they already have a leg up against their competition. But why is that? What is agricultural education doing differently that sets these middle school and high school students on a path for success? Well, I think to best understand the benefits of agricultural education to all of our students, we need to have a better understanding of the whole picture of the whole program of agricultural education. So I'm a proud product of school-based agricultural education, and I also grew up in a town, in the very middle of town, completely separated from production agriculture, like many students here in Kosciuszko County. Now, people often question, why was I an FFA? Why did I like agricultural education? Why did I want to become an ag teacher when my connection to the farm, my experience out in the production world was very, very limited. Well, I can tell you that's because agricultural education goes beyond the traditional classroom, beyond just that curriculum and the standards that are taught. A complete ag ed program matches what we call the three component model. There we go. So there are three parts to agricultural education that work together to provide students a really well-rounded and complete experience. And those components are the classroom, supervised agriculture experiences, and FFA. Now, the classroom teaches students science and math concepts through agriculture. Supervised agriculture experiences, or SAEs, provide students real-world, work-based opportunities, allowing to them to utilize those concepts that they're taught in their class. 
And then finally, the FFA focuses on helping students develop them, their leadership skills and prepare them for future careers. In fact, the mission statement of the National FFA organization is to develop students' potential for premier leadership, personal growth, and career success through agricultural education. Each of these components are equally important and should be focused on for the same amount of time, and none of them can really operate without each other. Recently, a former past state FFA officer talked about this three-component model in terms of a s'more. You've got your graham crackers, your marshmallow, and your chocolate. And each of these taste really good on their own, right? And if you mix any two of them together, you start to increase their taste and their flavor. But when you combine all three, you ultimately make the most robust and enjoyable dessert experience that you can. And the true is same with agricultural education. Without having all three components as a focus and a priority for all of our students, then they're not able to have that robust and complete educational experience. So while this picture of agricultural education looks really great, again, people often ask, what does ag ed really provide our students? And what about those students that aren't interested in agriculture? These are both really great questions and ones that I, as a seventh grader, also asked. But if we kind of look where it, ag education came from and where it's headed, we can kind of start to see how it's valuable to each and every single one of our students. So real quick, let's go back in time. In the early 1900s, there we go, agricultural education and production practices, they were taught by firsthand experience, right? Most people either worked out on the farm, learned how to raise crops and livestock from their family members by working side by side. Now, formal ag education had been established, but it was at the post-secondary level, at the college level, in 1862 through the Morrill Act. This kind of kept things distant from the farm, distant from production, because not everyone could actually make it out to college. Then in 1914, the Smith-Lever Act established the extension, extension service. Now this really helped because all of a sudden that research, those things that were happening at the university could make it out to the producers because they were in each and every single county. But the big one is finally on February 23rd, 1917, so just almost 100 years ago, the Smith-Hughes Act was passed, creating agricultural education in our local high schools. Congress felt that education and research at the university level was really effective and going well, but that if we could teach those agriculture practices to our younger students, we might have an actual impact in their daily lives. Because back in early 1900s, there's a good chance that most of those students didn't even finish high school, let alone go off to college to learn the new practices and technologies. So these early courses really focused primarily on production and were for our country or our farm kids. And they set the stage and provided a foundation for today's agricultural classroom. Eleven years after that, this, after the Smith-Hughes Act, the Future Farmers of America was organized. And from the beginning, FFA provided students an opportunity to really develop leadership skills and compete against each other in career-related events. The important thing is that school-based agricultural education has always designed the curriculum to meet the students' needs. In the past, a lot of students lived on the farm or were very closely connected to the farm, and so those courses remained very production-based. But now today, almost 100 years after that Smith-Hughes Act, the landscape of agriculture and agricultural education is very different. The agriculture industry is consistently advancing and changing, trying to keep up with the current trends in science and technology. Additionally, the average American is roughly three generations removed from the farm, removed from production agriculture. Now, a lot of people think that this is an issue because that means that, that people don't have a great understanding of agriculture, but I think it's a great opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to become more diverse in our base of students. It's an opportunity for us to have increased innovation and advancement, and overall an opportunity for agriculture to collaborate with other industries. Today, agriculture is quite possibly one of the most diverse industries in terms of career opportunities with over 235 unique careers in agriculture, many of which touch other industries as well. Agricultural education is providing information and experiences related to each of these unique careers every day in the classrooms of our middle schools and high schools. And today's agriculture instructor is licensed in Indiana to teach 
15 different courses, many of which you'll have the opportunity to hear about later today. These courses provide opportunities for every single middle school and high school student, no matter their background. These teachers in these courses are preparing students for careers that didn't exist 10 to 15 years ago, and many careers that don't exist right now today. Production agriculture and farming are still very central to agricultural education and FFA. They're our base. But just in a slightly different way, as more science and technology continue to be incorporated. As many of you well know, STEM education, or science, technology, engineering, and math, is a high priority in today's educational system. Agriculture is one of the best examples of STEM in my mind because it's truly applied STEM. Often, people look at STEM as four completely separate disciplines. But agriculture combines all four of them to create new technologies, to create new traits in our crops and our animals, and to overall be innovative. Nearly everything that happens in agriculture today utilizes those STEM principles. In fact, just the other week, I was down in Indianapolis at the National FFA Convention, and I saw a Case IH tractor that didn't have a cab for the operator. Instead, it was completely flat across the top, and it was run completely via remote control and other technologies. Last year, I was down at the John Deere School at Vincennes University, and these students have to learn how to work on equipment that has so much technology. In fact, there was an engine block that had over 40 different electronic sensors on it, just on the engine block alone. So not only do those students have to be good mechanics and figure out how to work with that, but they also have to diagnose and calibrate the sensors and computers. If we take that into plant science, we can look at one of Purdue University professors, Dr. Gabiza Ajeda, who used technology to genetically select for and modify grain sorghum to be more drought and insect tolerant and also be more nutritious. This was done in a relatively short research time instead of over decades of randomly selecting different plants and breeding them together hoping for the right result. Now, hundreds of thousands in Africa have a quality and safe food source. This cross-curricular work and this integration of other industries into agriculture isn't just happening out in the field or up at the university level. It's also happening right here in our middle school and high schools. Now, just as ag education has updated and modified the curriculum to meet today's needs and today's industry, so is FFA. Throughout the years, we've added tons of new programs to help broaden our audience appeal than just simply the rural farm kids. Some examples of that would be things like changing our name from the Future Farmers of America to the National FFA Organization. Why? Because agriculture is more than just farming, and we wanted to demonstrate that. Things like allowing females to be part of the organization in the late 1960s. Now they account for 50% of our membership and almost half of our leadership positions. Or even the fact that each of the top 15 most populous cities in the United States offer agricultural education and FFA in at least one or more of their high schools. This is expanding our curriculum into urban settings and generating all kinds of new opportunities for collaboration. Just as the curriculum has been updated, FFA has also increased their competitive opportunities in areas like sales, marketing, and communications. Now, I'm not exactly sure ex what the future holds for agriculture, for agricultural education, and for FFA, but I do know that it is promising. Everyone in the industry is excited about the growth and the diversification that's been happening the past few years. And agriculture cannot and will not operate in an independent space. Instead, content areas like STEM and the humanities will continue to be incorporated. You know, originally we referred to teaching agriculture. Then we started to say that we were teaching agri-science. And now, I'm even starting to hear people say that we're teaching ag-biosciences. The agricultural education curriculum and FFA are constantly being reviewed at the national, state, and local levels, trying to look towards the future to ensure that we're meeting the needs of our students that we're meeting the needs of our FFA members. One thing I do know is that agricultural education and FFA provide valuable skills and knowledge for every single middle and high school student, even those not initially interested in agriculture. And it's really evident if we break down that three component model. So that agriculture curriculum, it's applicable to numerous other content areas. Let's take animal science, for example. 
The body systems and structures of an animal are very similar to humans and what is taught in biomedical sciences. In fact, I have a good friend that's a doctor and when I would share what we were studying in my advanced animal science class, he was always amazed about the vocabulary and the concepts that we were talking about because he didn't cover them until junior year of college. If we look at the supervised agricultural experiences, what student can't benefit from developing work ethic and responsibility that would be valuable in any future career? Through FFA, every student can gain some leadership skills like speaking and teamwork by participating in different competitive events, by being an officer, or organizing other activities or community service. Often, people ask our members, they ask our teachers, why? Why do you spend all of this extra time outside of the classroom? Why do you spend all this time going to FFA events? Why are you so passionate about these programs? While everybody probably has slightly different reasons or examples, they all follow a common theme, and that theme is something that National FFA has defined as their vision. And that vision is to grow leaders, build communities, and strengthen agriculture. In the end, everybody wants to develop and strengthen our students. Everybody wants to have a strong local community, and everybody wants to have a strong overall industry and career field to work in. Today, agriculture is beyond the farm, and it includes science and technology, communications and marketing, education and sales. If we're collectively working together to advance the industry, our students, through agricultural education, at the end of the day, they're going to be able to feed the world and that growing population. But more importantly, here locally, they're going to be able to help solve some of those challenges that are face facing our communities and our country. I want to thank you so much for the time today, and thank you for your investment into agricultural education and FFA. You know, it's possible that the next great innovator in the agricultural biosciences is here in this room in one of the Blue Jackets. And each and every single one of you are truly helping us grow leaders, build communities, and strengthen agriculture every single day. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Our next speaker is Kelly Kreider. Kelly grew up on her family's grain and livestock farm in Whitley County, where she developed her love, love for agriculture at a very young age. She obtained both her bachelor and master of science degrees in youth development and agricultural education from Purdue University, West Lafayette. Kelly spent five years teaching agriculture to grades seven through 12 and coaching FFA before moving on to Ivy Tech Community College where she currently serves as an assistant professor and as their agriculture program chair. Kelly and her husband Taylor still live in Whitley County with their two boys, Caden and Cole. Welcome, Kelly. Well, good morning and thank you for the warm introduction. It is an honor to be here this morning. I think I'm gonna take this out. Otherwise, sometimes I can get too loud. They do have a PowerPoint, maybe. Technology at its finest. I'll go ahead and get started, though. I'm gonna start you off with a couple uh, statistics, some facts. So, did you know today's farmers are producing 262% more food with 2% fewer inputs? So labor, feed, um, your inputs such as seed, fertilizer. When compared to the 1950s, our current world population is nearly 7.3 billion people. They're projecting that to increase to 9.7 billion by 2050. What does that mean for our farmers today? That we need to more than double production between now and then. Our U.S. Secretary, Mr. Tom Vilsack, said nearly 10% of U.S. jobs are related to agriculture. The increasing complex nature of production requires more training and education in science, technology, engineering, and math. Indiana Agriculture employs over 75,000 Hoosiers. Now, where am I going with all this? That's what my students would usually ask. Where are you going with this? Now, to my knowledge, every human, and every animal for that matter, must eat. Go ahead, sorry. Therefore, oh, oh, way back. There you go. There. 
If you eat, you are involved in agriculture, whether or not you want to be or not. And there really is more to the farm than a barn. So for today, we're gonna, start, we're gonna start off talking a little bit about what's on today's farms and even what's in some of those barns for that matter. So let's set the stage. I pulled some pictures. I'm gonna pick on the 1950s particularly. Typical barn setting, your barns, your farmhouse. Let's talk about livestock being raised out open pasture. Let's also talk about what was the best method to put our crops in the ground at the time. Fast forward to today. Now, Rob mentioned this. Any of you FFA members, any of you community members from that matter that were at National Convention, did you see this tractor? FFA members, did you see it? Okay. Autonomous tractor, we have it, it's here. New Holland had one as well. Bottom picture down here, as you listen, you can hear it going over here, hydroponics. This actually, one of the pictures I took with uh, down at Get Fresh Farms in Fort Wayne. And then I have a picture here on the bottom of, of local fresh produce. How many of you enjoyed the eggs from Creighton Brothers this morning? Or the bacon from Maple Leaf, okay? And up here in the corner, what am I looking at here? Something that a lot of our farmers, because the average age of the farmer is 60 plus, some of them are very intimidated by this image because what's it telling them? Lots of data on what's going on in their, in their field and that machine can read it out to them instantly. So let's think back to the past 10 years, just the 10 years. How have careers changed in agriculture? Now, I won't date myself entirely, but let's think about this. I'm gonna throw some terms at you. Precision planning, planting by the inch, auto steer, variable rate technology, UAVs. Mm. Facebook, how many of you have Facebook? How many of you have Twitter? Facebook wasn't around until 2004, just so you know. So some of you FFA members, it's been around for as long as you can remember. I remember when it came about, okay, once again, I won't date myself, but I remember when it came about, social media. Now, as an educator, it's my job to help prepare our youth for jobs that we don't even know that exist yet in the next 10 years. Top five skills that employers are looking for, and I want you guys to shout these out. Top five skills that employers are looking for, what are they? Work ethic. Work ethic. What else? Attitude. <coughs> Timeliness. Problem solving. Problem solving. <laughs> what else do we have out there? Reliability. Reliability. Any others? Drive. Motivation, drive, communication skills. What do all of these have in common? Something called a soft skill. And I get asked all of the time as an educator, how are you teaching these soft skills? And you know the best response? You can't teach some of those soft skills. But we can work on it. So here's what we do. My goal is to challenge my students while I have them in the classroom with situations that are going to build on these skills. So for example, what do I do? This is how I answer the question when people ask me. Class begins promptly, let's say 8.30, which by the way, my students are not complaining about having to cancel class for me not being there this morning, so thank you. Class begins promptly at 8.30. What do I do? My door gets closed and locked. Now, not because I'm extremely mean, but what am I trying to do? It's easy to monitor, of course, who comes in late, because they have to knock to get in, so it's embarrassing. But would you be able to keep a job if you showed up late? No. Promptness, we, we need to work on that. Accountability. How about posting the agenda for the class? It's posted online, easy access for students to gain. So they know exactly what we should be doing in class every, every week. I'll throw a curve in their schedule, just a little bit. We need to adapt, guys. We're gonna make some adjustments, and we're gonna roll with it. Maybe we don't have the lab supplies today that we needed. Maybe your teacher forgot something. So we're gonna adapt. We're going to get creative. Of course, we also have projects involving individual work, teamwork, problem solving, conflict resolution. Let's talk about that. How many of you had a conflict with another coworker at some point in time? Raise your hands. And this goes for all of you out here and students. Yes. And how many of you sometimes have struggled reaching a resolution for that conflict? Difference of opinions, right? So a good example of what I'll give you here of what we've done in class. It's nice because I can set the situation up for them. We can practice this for when real life 
when they get put out in the, in the workforce. I'm going to give you an idea. For example, organic versus conventional farming. Hot topic for us in your, uh, northeastern Indiana, particularly in the Fort Wayne area. I have students come to me all the time. I want to grow all organic, all natural, have my own little farm. Do you teach that? Well, we cover a component of that. However, we need to make sure that you're aware of, is that always going to feed the, the growing world? So we definitely cover more on the production commercial side, but we will cover organic. So it's a hot topic, very controversial. What's great is I can have students take sides, and sometimes it's not the side they want to take, and then we have to get through that conflict resolution part, and we reach an agreement. Is there a right or wrong way? Sometimes no, but we need to hear both parties out. How do I measure success when I'm teaching these skills? Observation of students. That's the, the great part of, of my job sometimes. I can see them in class and I can see them out of class. And I'll share some pictures here of what we do outside of class as well. I also have this class, it's called Seminar, it's AGR 290. Every student has to take it before they can graduate. So it gives me that chance to kind of put my last little stamp on them before I let them out into the real world. We get to start working on job interview skills, adequate training, what is it that you really need to have before we turn you loose out here in the, in the world? Now, we've got community members here. FFA members, I have a question for you. Raise your hand if you work someplace. Okay, so you have a job. Now, this goes for everybody in the crowd. When you got your first job, did you ever think about the skills that it took to get that job? Raise your hand. Did you ever think about it or did you just hope you got a job? You probably just hoped you got the job, right? So what skills do we need? What do our youth particularly, or a lot of my students either, I see young students, but I see students, mine are straight out of, out of high school, some are still in high school, all the way up to I had a 70-year-old lady, okay? So I have a variation of age. I have individuals that are looking to change their career path. What skills do we need? So let's talk about this. Let's talk about entry level, and this is my opinion here on, on some note, okay? Think about entry-level jobs. Those soft skills that we just talked about, pretty key. So start working on those now, FFA members. You're in the right spot with those blue jackets. Let's talk about two-year grads, soft skills. Now we start getting to hard skills. So the knowledge you actually need to complete a specific task. But I'm also gonna add some job experience in there. And then let's talk about four-year degrees. Soft skills, notice a the common theme, soft skills. Hard skills, job experience, but what's the difference, two year to four year, what's the difference when I'm talking about skills required for specific jobs? More knowledge, the hard knowledge, and more job experience. Any of you employers out here, have any of you done either personally or had high school or college interns? Okay. Invaluable experience, incredible. And I'll talk about what that what we have with Ivy Tech, particularly for internship experiences. So I want to focus on two-year, because of course that's, that's what I do with Ivy Tech. And I've, I've tried really hard not to, to really focus on Ivy Tech today, but I want to tell you how we have opportunities for students to continue their education in agriculture and to continue their education in technology specifically with agriculture. So I mentioned how we, of course, are developing the soft skills within the classroom. We, of course, provide those hard knowledge skills, the information they need to do their job. But I do something a little unique as well. I'm going to go to the next, next slide. There we go. Our two different degrees. And it's important that I, I touch on this briefly so you understand where I'm coming from. We have two degree paths within agriculture, our AS degree and our AAS degree. The AS, Associates of Science, was designed specifically to transfer to Purdue University. We also have Huntington University on board with us now, too. That degree, two years with us, two years with your transferring college. So we have right there cut the financial contribution for students in half. And it's convenient for students that live up in this area. They can still work their job, be on the family farm if that's where they're coming from, before they have to go down to Purdue for two years, or Huntington, whichever they choose. The AAS degree, and this is where I'm going to focus, because 90% of my students are on the AAS track, Associates of Applied Science degree. We have several transferring universities, more on the list coming. The one I, I'm personally working with the most, of course, is Trine, because they're in our backyard being in Fort Wayne. They offer in-class, they offer online options for students to get their bachelors. Once again, two years with us, two years with them. That's the way all these programs are set up. Colorado State, though. So I was at National Convention a couple weeks ago and was talking to Colorado State representative. They're wanting to work with us to design a four-year bachelor's in agriculture program 
online for our students. So it's coming. This is exciting for my students. We're very excited about this opportunity. What's the difference between the two degrees? That's usually what people ask me. In, in the, the easiest terms I can tell you, the AS, you take five agriculture classes. The AAS degree, you take about five math, science, English classes. They're completely reversed. Why is it designed that way? AS was designed to transfer to Purdue. They're the experts in agriculture, okay? So when we first designed that degree, that's why we designed it to set up like that. The AAS gives students a diverse background of all the agriculture industry jobs, um, em employment options that you can think of uh, that would get them a job right away. So just to help you kind of get the difference between the two. I also want to tell you a little bit about, we offer certifications. So for example, a landscape technician, we offer classes that students can become a certified crop advisor, so CCA. We also offer classes to complete your pesticide applicator's licensure, grain handling safety, OSHA safety training. All of these classes are embedded within our AAS degree. So students can have all of that and get their AAS degree without taking any additional courses. Lab-based classes, we are in the classroom, or out of the classroom just as much as we're in the classroom, and I'll show you some pictures here in just a minute so you get an idea of where we're going, what we're doing, and why, and how this fits into our curriculum. And then uh, I also offer a class that's very unique to Ivy Tech Fort Wayne, and I call it a travel class. It's a U.S. field experience class, but we spend 10 weeks throughout the semester, one day, 8 to 10 hours each day, with a select group of students. They have to have taken so many classes, ag classes to be able to take this class. We travel to different agribusinesses across the state of Indiana. Why am I doing that? What am I doing? Exposing them to different agribusinesses, potential career opportunities, areas that they had no idea that they may potentially be able to go into for a career. I'm gonna go on to the next slide. I'll show you a little bit about what we do. So I already mentioned to you with the hydroponics, this is actually an aquaponics setup down at Get Fresh Farms in Fort Wayne. So my uh, horticulture class goes there. Top right picture, a horticulture class again, we were talking a floriculture unit. Went to, Fort Wayne has a do-it-yourself florist shop, so we went there and they got to design their own uh, arrangements. Bottom picture, a picture that you would not have seen in the 1950s. So um, those of you that have farm equipment, does this look familiar? Raise your hand. Okay, any of you that farm? Yes, we wouldn't have had any type of GPS monitoring whatsoever on our tractors then. Great opportunity for my students here though. So another fun fact, I would say 75% of my students come to me with not a whole lot of agriculture background experience. Now they may have come with an FFA background or 4-H experience, but not your traditional farming. And people sometimes get confused by that. And I like that Rob mentioned, agriculture education has changed. And we, have, of course, are seeing that in the college level, too, that our students are coming to us with not that farming background whatsoever. So it's my job to give them experience. If they're interested in working particularly, uh, let's say that they're going to be troubleshooting or setting up the uh, monitors for in the tractors, the combines, whatever have you, it might be helpful if you've driven one at one point in time. So my class, my crop production class, I give them that opportunity to be able to do that if they've never done that before. Next slide, please. Left-hand corner, talking about community connections. So Whiteshire Hamrock Swine Operation, my animal science class was up there. Right-hand picture for you, uh, animal science class, a blind taste test for eggs. So we did farm fresh, we did cage-free, organic, and they didn't know what kind they were tasting until afterwards. Bottom picture, Country Heritage Winery. Uh, my horticulture class was there when we were talking about wine production and processing. We have a wine production class coming on the books now that we're going to be offering as well for at Ivy Tech. And yes, FFA members, as a college student, if you're 21, you can do sampling. Next. Top picture here on the left, uh, some of you have been to this, Fair Oaks Dairy. So we go there to, of course, see not only the dairy production, the swine operation, they have poultry coming. And then I partner with uh, Keenert Dairy, which is right outside of, uh, kind of, it's still Allen County, but right outside of Fort Wayne area. They have the robotic dairy, so the students get to see what the robots look like with the dairy operation. They also have their traditional milking parlor still, so students can see where we've, where we've been, where we're at now with the, the robots. Top picture, we were uh, working on setting up a planter. Happened to be John Deere with this one. We try to do all, all different colors, so that way students get a variety. Bottom picture, Apache sprayers. Uh, we went through the plant. They did a tour down south of Indianapolis. My travel class did that. Go ahead. And I'll come back to this. So I want to talk about high school students here, the FFA members that are here in our blue jackets. What work-based learning opportunities do you have? Now, I will say that you're already a step up. 
Why? Because you're an FFA. So you're getting that hands-on experience that you need. And, and that's the, a great way to do it. A lot of our students don't get that. So the students that come to me don't have that opportunity. So what can you continue to do as a high school student? And Rob mentioned this earlier. Um, we have lots of dual credit classes that you can actually start taking as high school students. And there's a paper floating around on all the tables that tell you all the classes that are available to high school students and which ones we have dual credit agreements with. So what does that mean? That means that our high school teachers are teaching Ivy Tech courses at the high school level, free of charge for our high school students. So what does that mean then for the student? If they decide to come to Ivy Tech, those transfer free. Those are free credits. So if you start doing the math, we have eight classes on there that are dual credit with Ivy Tech. Students can come to me with one to two semesters complete, which equals out an entire year. All right, well, Ivy Tech sets up on usually a two-year basis. That means you only really have about one year left. And then you get to go directly into the workforce or transfer on to a, a university. Keep in mind, all those were free. Financially smart choices there. Other opportunities that high school students have. So I actually have several high school seniors, and I've had a junior in the past, homeschool students as well, that will come and take a class with us. So they may take just one or two classes with us on campus per semester. Great way to get them some college experience, college credit, if they can fit it in their schedule. So keep those opportunities in mind as well. I also do something, this will be our second year for it, coming up this Friday. So you FFA members, if your advisors haven't mentioned anything to you about it, here it is. It's called an iCareer Ag Day on campus. What we do is invite, it's for FFA, FFA minded here, districts two, three, and six, so the northeastern corner, um, students. And the reason I invite them is because our other campuses for Ivy Tech that have ag programs are Kokomo and Marion. So I try not to get too close into to their territory, if you will. But I invite northeastern Indiana schools to come spend a day with us on campus. So students will get an hour to spend with a little mini lesson being taught by our current students, alumni students, adjunct faculty. So they actually get a feel for what it's like to be an Ivy Tech ag student. We get a free lunch, we get campus tours. So if you aren't coming and you're interested in coming, let me know, I can get you more information. But another day where I try to get students on campus so they can get a feel for what that's like. So let's talk a little bit about what's next in agriculture. And we have a lot of professionals that are gonna be on this panel here in just a little bit. So when it comes to specifically here in Kosciuszko County, I'm gonna let some of them that have their business here in Kosciuszko County really hone in on that. I'm gonna take a big picture. And the reason I'm gonna take a big picture view with this is because I'm on the, think about the, the college university and where we're at trying to train students. So we need people for jobs that don't exist. I mentioned that earlier. So in what specifically you ask? Technology, think about informatics. Think about computer programming, design. Troubleshooting devices in and out of the field. I mentioned earlier, the average age of the farmer is 60 years plus. So it's guys like my dad that are calling me and saying, come set up my tremble unit because I don't know how to do this. It intimidates me. Then I get it set up and he's calling, okay, it's beeping at me and I can't make it stop. It's guys like that. We need people to help. We need people that are interested and willing to learn these new technologies because as I said, these farmers that are reaching that 60 plus years it's intimidating for them. Think about how much they've seen as a change in their years. I think about my years growing up as a kid and how much, I was just talking with my dad the other day. So we started with the Gleaner Combine. And let me just tell you about this Gleaner Combine. I remember, okay, so of course no heating, no air conditioning. My seat was on the toolbox on the floor because there were no fancy buddy seats with cushion or air ride. I had to help dad get the auger to swing out just to unload. There was no button you push, okay? Some of you are shaking your head because you remember. I was just talking to Dad about this the other day because he's talking about getting a new combine. He doesn't still have the gleaner, mind you, okay? Um, but I couldn't remember when he, he got the combine that he has now because I remember going from that gleaner to a newer combine. I just couldn't remember when. So I think about just in, in my lifespan how much we've seen as a difference and a change. So we're going to need people for these jobs. We're going to need people. That autonomous tractor, the, the tractor we have that's driving itself, okay, and Case isn't the only one. New Holland has it. John Deere has it. They're there. We need people that are willing to learn to help get these out into our fields, to where we and our farmers can start to use these. Think about the farm to fork movement. Indiana has a program called Indiana Grown. Some of you may be familiar with that term, okay? Any of you ever, and I'm gonna go back to my FFA members, and even some of you, even you business people, any of you ever aspire to own your own business? Let's talk about entrepreneurship here. 
I always ask my students this, any entrepreneurs in the field? Yeah. If there's an interest at all for you to find that niche market, this is it, this farm to fork. We've, we've did a, an example of that today, being able to use locally grown produce. It's here. People want to know where their food's coming from. How about this, alternative energy sources. Did you know, I didn't know this, I just learned this this past week, so I'm pretty excited. We now have an electrochemical process that uses tiny spikes of carbon and copper to turn carbon dioxide, which is an, a greenhouse gas, into, of all things, ethanol. Did you know that? But guess what? We still need researchers to continue to research and get this technology available to us. We need you, and we need you to be interested in these topics. Now I'm gonna show one more, oh, this picture, before I forget, this picture is a Fort Wayne Farm Show. So um, I've got two more slides here, and I wanna throw this in here a little bit about community service and going back to teaching some of those soft skills and skills that I can't necessarily teach in the classroom. So Fort Wayne Farm Show, we do a booth where my students actually, for my classes, rather than being in class that week, I cancel class, and if they were to be in class for three or four hours, they work the farm show for three or four hours. Go ahead. And this last site, so community service is important to me. It's something that I grew up doing, not because I had to, so make sure our youth understand it's not community service you're assigned to, it's community service that you volunteer for. And so we do a lot of different things in the community, and these pictures here particularly are with a local fall festival. It's something that's close to me because I grew up doing it with my family, so I got my students involved. Uh, we do a, an exhibit in the parade, and then we do the, there's an NTPA tractor pull, demolition derby, so my students help with that. What's really neat is we actually were given, we did the 50-50, and they decided, the tractor pullers decided to give us that money from the 50-50. Nothing that we would have ever anticipated. We just did it for fun and great advertisement for the program. But sometimes when you're, not, when you're least expecting uh, surprises, you get a nice surprise. So that was, that was really nice. And my last slide here, so any of you that are interested, uh, we do have a Facebook page, speaking of, of social media. So IB Ag Innovators, it's our student organization on campus. If you're interested, I always tell people that this is the best way to see what it is that we are doing. We post everything from class on here. I also want to mention at the top, so we have coming, if any of you have been to our campus, we have coming a new state-of-the-art commercial grade greenhouse. It'll be aquaponics equipped. We'll be in it by next fall of 17. So I'm really excited about that opportunity coming. So I'm gonna end with one of my favorite quotes, and this quote was given to me as, a stu as one of my students, actually, my very first couple weeks teaching, so way back. And the quote reads, nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. Ralph Waldo Emerson. I strive my life to live enthusiastically, um, not only in my classroom, but outside my classroom. Because after all, if I'm not excited, how can I expect my students to be excited? I have found my passion in agriculture, so I challenge you, to look beyond the barn and the farm and find what it is that you're passionate about and to go about it enthusiastically. Thank you so much for this morning. I appreciate it. I can see how she is um, helping teach enthusiasm, can't you? Okay, I want to invite Jacob Riley to come up and talk to us a little bit about the displays that are around the room and how you um, can interact with them in the next few minutes. Good morning. <clears throat> Apologize for the voice here, uh, fighting a little bit of illness here. Uh, but uh, make it brief here, uh, you can see around the room here several displays set up. Uh, just activities that we have in class for the different pathways, different classes that we teach in agricultural education. And so uh, over here you'll see uh, agribusiness and also the uh, ag power structure and technology classes. Again, some great demonstrations over here for those, uh, along with uh, some of our life science uh, concentrations here. And so we have food science and animal science over here on this side. Over on this side, we see uh, plant science and natural resource concentrations here as well. And then we also have the pathway for uh, horticulture and natural resource, or horticulture and landscaping here as well. And so lots of different classes within each pathway. Feel free to ask questions, uh, get involved. Uh, the kids are excited to talk to you, so uh, I'll leave it to you guys. <clears throat> Thank you.
So for the next 30 minutes or so, the panel will respond to questions that we submitted to them ahead of time. I have one wireless mic, and so um, I'm going to ask an industrial question, an educational question, and so forth. We have a lot of questions in only 30 minutes and a number of panelists, so not every panelist will answer every question. Um, so what's going to happen, panelists, is if you feel particularly um, called to answer a particular question, I want you to kind of raise your hand and I'll pass you the mic, and if no one does, then I will assign someone to answer questions. <laughs> Don't let the power go to my head, volunteer, okay? Okay, so on the industrial side, and I'm going to read them in the order that they're on my sheet so that I don't miss anyone. So if you'll raise your hand in case everyone doesn't know you guys are introducing you. Kip Tom. Kip is a past candidate for U.S. Congress in Indiana's 3rd District and is the chairman of Tom Farms and Sayers Incorporated. He has served on multiple boards, including the Indiana Economic Development Corporation from 2005 to 15, the Indiana State Department of Agriculture from 2005 to 15, and is currently serving as a board member of the Indiana Chamber of Commerce, where he has served since 06, and of the Farm Journal Agricultural Foundation since 2008. He started his career as a production and in production technician for Tom Farms in 1973. He has progressed through many management capacities and currently leads all finance, strategy, and production operations in the U.S. and South America for Tom Farms agribusinesses. He is also a consultant to both granular ag management software company and institutional investors in ag equities. So we'll save our warm welcome and applause to the very end, but welcome Kip. Jeremy Mullins. Jeremy is a 1995 graduate of Purdue University School of Agriculture. Having served on various industry boards over the years, Jeremy currently serves as a board member of the Indiana Soybean Alliance. He is also currently a board member of Cassiasco Economic Development Corporation, Cassiasco County Community Foundation, and Warsaw Community School Board of Trustees. In his free time, he enjoys coaching youth sports at the YMCA. He lives in Winona Lake with his wife, Oksana, and his daughter, Bailey, who's five, and his son, Ivan, who is three. So welcome, Jeremy. Tyler Bass is from Minton, Indiana. He was born and raised in Silver Lake, where his parents still reside. In 1998, he graduated from Purdue University with a Bachelor of Science degree in Agricultural Systems Management. He married a fellow Purdue graduate, Melissa, in 2005. They have three children, Nash, who is eight, Gentry, who is six, and Remington, who is three. All the children are proud bulldogs at Minton Elementary School. He is a district sales manager for Agri-Gold Hybrids. Tyler and his wife also own and operate Bass Farms LLC, where they manage 16,000 wean to finish contract hogs per year. He is a director on the Kosciuszko Farm Viewer Board and the Kosciuszko Extension Board. Tyler and his family attend Warsaw Community Church. Welcome, Tyler. Stephen Miller. Steve is a 1998 graduate of Tippecanoe Valley High School. He studied accounting at Manchester College while working in his family's business, which I asked him about earlier. It was a fencing business. Steve has worked for the past 10 years as a manager at Creighton Brothers, dealing with environmental regulations, land management, crops, technical services, and special projects. Steve has been married to his high school sweetheart, Jill, for 17 years, and they have three children, Kaylee, who's 10, and Brent, who is 8, and Ethan, who is 3. He attends Warsaw Community Church and is a member of Indiana Farm Bureau and serves on the Water Policy Advisory Group. So welcome, Steve. Our panel of educators includes Rob Hayes and Kelly Kreider. So if they would wave, I introduced them and you met them earlier today. And Celia Glowacki. Celia is an Oklahoma native. She joined the Indiana Department of Education in February of 2016 as the state program leader for agriculture. Her other duties included overseeing the Department of Education's pathways work and acting as state program leader for fine arts. Celia was active in 4-H and FFA during her high school years, including earning her state and American FFA degrees. She attended Cornell University and worked in various aspects of television, public relations, marketing, and community relations before joining the IDOE. We also have with us some ag educators. We have Mariah Roberts, who's the ag educator with Wallace Community Schools. I don't have a written bio on Mariah, but I've known her and known of her she was a student at Tippie Valley High School and know she is um, passionate about that. 
and Mike Jones, who's an ag educator at Tippecanoe Valley Schools. I understand he comes uh, from Argus Community Schools, and, uh, where he was there for 16 years. Is that right? As an ag educator, give or take. Okay. So we have a lot of experience up here. We're going to get started. <coughs> All right, my first question is for industrial leaders. We're going to make sure we have our mics turned on here. All right, how have career opportunities in the ag industry changed in the past 10 years? And there are a couple of sub questions if you want to address either of these. So, what skills are needed, maybe, that weren't needed 10 years ago? And um, specifically, what are some of the soft skills that are necessary? Uh, for career opportunities in the act. So how has it changed in the past 10 years and what skills and soft skills are needed? Do I have a volunteer? <laughs> I did bring notes so I wouldn't talk till lunchtime, so <laughs> feel free to step in, Kevin, and correct me. Right so I think uh, what I've seen in the past 10 years is uh, the demand for agriculture jobs has just skyrocketed. And uh, there's probably a lot of reasons. There's two that I, I wrote down to make sure I focus on those. Two that, uh, that affect me directly. Uh, one is the creation of the Renew Renewable Fuel Standard, or the RFS, and that was in 2005. And the other is, is the uh, what affects pretty much all industry, but specifically agriculture, is just the rise in the middle class in China. Uh, the RFS, what that means is it created our, so our biodiesel plant in Claypool and all these ethanol plants that are around the Midwest. So all that came of, uh, because of the, the RFS. And what that is, is a mandate to use so much biodiesel and ethanol. And that's a, an environmental reason is why it was created, but also to help create real jobs and all those things. But because of that, there's a, there's a huge demand for soybean oil to make biodiesel, which in essence means a huge demand for soybeans, and a huge demand for ethanol, or for corn to make ethanol. So uh, that one act back in 2005 has changed the agriculture world. Uh, it, you know, it's been half of my career, it's been since that. I've been doing this for over 20 years, and, Half of us been since the RFS, so it's made a huge impact, uh, not just globally, but here locally. I mean, obviously, what we're what we're doing uh, in Claypool, and then what all the farmers and the, the, the other industries that supply us have, have done since then. And of course, the rise of the middle class in China, like I said, has impacted a lot of industry, uh, most mostly agriculture, because of their demand for meat. They have more money in their economy, so that's created uh, a huge demand for meat, which means demand for soybean meal, uh, corn, other types of feed. So that impacts all of agriculture, not just what I do as a processor, but the farmer, of course. It's really changed the, the, uh, the landscape for, of pricing. Uh, input cost is probably the biggest impact because we had a, a, a huge surge in price over time, but then that's backed off. However, the input costs have not, so that's created more challenges there. So uh, these, these two things, like I said, uh, have created, uh, created a demand that affected all of agriculture, which means demand for jobs for students to come out and help do all these, these things that we need done. Um, for example, Dean Ackridge at Purdue has told me on many occasions that they cannot produce enough Agicon students to meet the demand uh, in, the, in the industry. So there's so many jobs out there that we can't fill. So what type of skills? Uh, the most basic, I think, and that affects all jobs. Um, talking about entry-level jobs. At our, at our facility, for example, we have office staff and we have production staff, not the plant, the manufacturing plant. And computer students. It, it sounds so obvious, but uh, I guess, you know, I'm 43 years old. We didn't really use computers growing up. Uh, they existed, I think, in some places, but not in Clark County. At least not in more Henry Washington, where I went to school and not at uh, our high school level. But today, every kid has computers, right? And you'd think they'd all come out and know how to use them. But I'm always surprised how many high school graduates come to work for us that can't use Microsoft Excel, that are unfamiliar with Outlook and basic computer skills that I just take for granted. Why wouldn't you know that? But I guess they're all using the phone. They don't use phones, but they don't really know how to use computers. So it's such a generic thing. I know it's not specific, but it's the one thing that I notice the most, and it drives me crazy when somebody says, well, I don't know how to save this file. Why not, you know? I've got a 73 year old man in the office that can do all kinds of things in Excel. So why can't an 18 year old from country out of high school? So, so those are some of the entry level skills that I think that are very, very important and I, I think they're very basic, but uh, they're, you, know, you, don't, you don't want to take those for granted. Those are, those are needed and not everybody that comes out of high school has those. As far as two year, four year degrees, uh, 
you know, I think of things like accounting, engineering, finance, HR, uh, all those types of things. But the most important skill is independent thinking, is in my mind. And uh, I know there's some educators sitting over here, there's some sitting out in front of us, but you know, the, the whole, you know, I don't want to try to go and say off my bandwagon or my soapbox about the, the, the it's testing. Uh, I've been on that since I was a kid taking those tests. But we don't care about test taking, right? We care about independent thinking and problem solving and the things that Kelly talked about earlier. Uh, those are what's really important. And uh, I think that's something we all need to, to work together. There's different communities here. We're one big community, but we have a lot of little communities within us. And we all need to work on those kind of things, uh, solve problems, working together, um, all the soft skills that we talked about. And if you want to continue, there's a question about how do we, what do we do to help develop those soft skills? Um, like she said, some of this stuff's in turn are born with it, either you're good at it or not. But we have a program called, we call it DNA. It stands for Developing New Aptitudes. It is a continuous improvement program. And uh, one of the, the modules in there is it's called self-development. And that's where we try to improve these soft skills. And one of the, the basic fundamentals of that self-development module is an internal locus of control. And that's believing that you control your destiny, that you control the outcome of things. Uh, and external locus of control is when you're a victim all the time. So what we try to do is, and I, this is the module that I'm in charge of, uh, I guess I have about the highest internal locus of control of anybody I know. I think I can control everything. You know, even though I know I'm wrong about that, I still don't stop believing that. And that's what we need to get more people to believe. You know, don't be a victim. Uh, things don't just happen in life. You've got to make them happen. Uh, and your success depends on yourself. And you own it. So, um, so those are some of the ways that we try to teach the, the soft skills that we've been talking about. Go ahead, get more keep talking. So everybody knows the challenge we have as an industry. And it's not just agriculture. It's food and agriculture, beverages. It's a whole supply chain getting the consumer. But we've got a hungry world to feed. And everybody knows we're going to be doing that with less resources than we have available to us today. Whether that's land, water, uh, the energy we consume, uh, we, we've got to be more efficient in the way we feed this world. We know that the world's food demand is going to double by the year 2050. So think about that for a moment. We've got to double the world's food supply because of changing incomes and growth in population, but at the same time, we're going to have less land to do it with. So one of the pathways to get there is the adaption of technology. I don't care whether it's in a, in a hog building or the technologies you use to, to monitor temperatures and, and humidity and what you do in your feed rations to change and how you produce a product for a pork hog for a specific end use and what we do on the grain side or seed production side. We've got to deploy technology. And data science uh, is one of the ways to get there. We all see the, the autonomous track record or, We've got one order to be here in 2018, probably one of the first ones out. But that's, that's cool and that's sexy, but that's not really where it's at in the future. The future is where the way we apply data science to uh, our protein production of whether it's chickens and eggs and crate mothers and hogs, or the way you apply some of the sciences at uh, Louis Dreyfus companies around the globe. Those are the things that's going to revolutionize and give us the ability to feed that hungry world. Our family settled here in 1837. I'm the seventh generation farmer from Northern Kaskaskia County. And George Tom's role was with his nine children just to produce enough food to feed their family. That's all his role was at that time. Maybe produce a little commerce on the side. Well, it's different for my generation. It's to be much more different for my children and my grandchildren if they choose to farm. So the burden's on us. The burden is on us. And as an industry, we need to be more involved. And I challenge the rest of us in this room to take that, that, that challenge and make a difference at our schools. I think we've got to work with counselors. We've got to support our educators, which we don't have enough of. I've got a granddaughter, it's in, uh, she's a freshman here at Warsaw, and she's going to be an ag educator, she claims. But we've got to have more. We've got to bring our youth along the way, and we've got to help them understand what our needs are. It's not just driving a tractor. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's... We've got to get people that can think critically. They've got to be problem solvers. They've got to look to the future. They've got to be entrepreneurs. You know, one of the things that we're doing in our business, and one of my roles right now, is strategic development of, of some food products from the products we produce, because value add opportunities to feed that growing population is going to be one of the keys to our success. So um, we need it all, but we've got to work with our educators to make sure we support David and the other educators in this room here that lead uh, great schools in this area and make sure they have the tools to advance these kids. Thank you.
I'll touch on a couple uh, because it's really interesting to see the blue jackets out here. Uh, it, it's exciting because the more you get involved, the more confidence is built, the more ambition, the more motivation because um, as, as a younger person going out into the world, whether it's you're going on to college or whether you're going into, uh, in, into a career afterwards, uh, the more experience you can gather through programs in schools such as FFA is critical. Um, soft skills versus hard skills. Somewhat of a newer tech wording to me, and I've educated myself on this the last couple weeks. So, so, I, so it has changed a lot because when I was in high school, which doesn't seem like that long ago, but in 1994 when I graduated, I learned how to keep how to type on a typewriter. Well, the next year, all of those were taken out, and it was changed over to a, a computer. Uh, we really have had to adapt, and we have adapted fast. Uh, soft skill or hard skills, I think one big change we've made is the hard skills are more your, your hands-on experiences, I would call them. Your soft skills are, are, are the quiet one, like Kelly talks. It's, it's not always taught, but boy, can we really help to move and mold and, 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 and as an education and, and as an epicenter of careers and internships that are out there, uh, to build motivation for, for you FFA members as well as the students out there. Uh, it is critical because as it moves into technology, you know, I, I equate it to, I'm diabetic. I've got an insulin pump on my side. It's not a beaver. I'm not that cool still. Uh, I've got an insulin pump on. I remember taking shots all the time. And then in 1998, I went to an insulin pump. And, and it's, it's amazing. The medical industry is moving fast. However, I, I would almost argue that the ag group is moving faster because, you know, that's cool. A tractor that runs by itself, that you're gonna be in a cloud, you can sit in, an, you can sit in one particular spot and manage all the data coming in from that. That is, that is exciting. And I think those opportunities are what lie out there for us. Um, the, the, the ag, industry is large and broad from processing uh, to logistics to the hands-on uh, uh, farm level which we still need and we still need entrepreneurs there um, but but I, I love working with with groups in high school through the uh, through the SAE program I've worked with some of the Grange it's exciting to see uh, the opportunities that exist for everybody out there we just have to uh, continue to mold those soft skills I believe and FFA does a great job of doing that. I just like to add, like as I walked around and looked at all the areas here that we had, um, Crane Brothers is a vertically integrated company. So we'd start from growing the feed to raising the chickens to producing the egg to then do the value add that Kip talked about. Um, and then we sell that product and it's just the full circle. Um, so every item that's out here, we have people that do that in our company. We have about 320 employees now. Um, but as I pointed out to the gentleman over here for the uh, ag power and structural and technology, all those careers, sometimes that's one guy. Um, we're so low staffed anymore that one guy needs to be diverse enough that he can do all that, that he can problem solve. Um, we've got all these tractors that do everything else and I'll get a phone call and I'm driving down the road and the guy in the tractor goes, my steering went out, what do I do? And sometimes I want to say the wheel in front of you drives just like your car, you can still grab it and drive. <laughs> but, They'll sit there and wait until you show up and do it, but you need to be able to look through and um, know enough technology that you can walk someone through those steps just in your head because it does change all the time. And we have Case tractors, John Deere tractors, and they're all different. They're all similar, but everything's different. So you have to be able to adapt and be very diverse in your knowledge base. Um, my last comment is everyone's young. Um, I'm 36 years old. And some people have worked at Creighton's as long as I've been alive. So when you're the young person going into a new company, you need those people skills to be able to talk to that guy that's been there longer than you've been alive so he doesn't think that you're coming in you think you know it all you need to be able to converse with that guy and say listen to him versus just cutting him off and then say well what about this and try to learn from them versus thinking well i know a better way you're still better to learn because they got to where they're at by learning throughout that time and sometimes you'll say oh that's a better idea and move on from there so Thank you. I'm going to switch over to our educators for the next question. You know that one of the strong components of ag, and 
particular the FFA programs is the, um, the teaching of leadership skills. So in your ag programs or in your, in your programs if you're not at the high school level, how are you teaching leadership skills and what other career skills are you teaching? So whoever wants to take that first. Well, like Kelly talked about earlier, it is extremely difficult to teach soft skills, but um, for me, that is a thing that I know um, students can learn content in other places. Um, I'm just not sure that they'll get soft skills until they get to work, and then that may become a problem because they may lose their very first job because they didn't have the skill that they needed. So one of the things that I try to do in my classroom is teach a little bit of work ethic, and the way I do that is um, by giving points, because in the realm of school, that's the motivation, um, I give points based on work ethic. So as my students are working on a project, I have a little stamper, and I may go to their paper, and if they are working, whether they have right answers or not, I give them a stamp um, to show them that their work is valuable. If they are trying and doing what they're supposed to do, their work is valuable. <clears throat> that's really hard um, in a school because our system statewide, nationwide, doesn't always reward work. Um, we reward correct answers. Um, and sometimes we reward one path to the correct answer. Um, but in my ag classroom, I have enough freedom to try and overcome some of those things and get kids to realize that that's okay, that they're going about it a different way than I suggested. Other leadership skills that we teach, I don't want to talk about that. Repeat the question. <laughs> Sure, so how are you teaching both leadership and career skills in your ag program? Uh, leadership skills, uh, I think uh, a lot of the leadership skills come from our, our team CDDs that we teach. Uh, almost all of them are team events, so kids have to work together as a team. Um, I would say that on uh, many of our state and national trips from CDE competitions, uh, when you get a bus full of five kids uh, that have to spend the entire week together, uh, they learn how to communicate together. Uh, whether that's necessarily me teaching them that, uh, uh, the opportunities, I think some of it just comes naturally from the opportunities that we give kids when they travel together and they work on uh, teams together. I guess I'll just add from the state level perspective, I think, you know, whether it's actually trying to teach it or more just provide situations that allow the students to develop those skills. So from the state level with FFA, we try and provide conferences where these students are able to come down to the leadership center and work with people from across the state and be engaged in teamwork and leadership development activities. We have seven state FFA officers in Indiana, and we constantly try and get them out into classrooms as much as we can to help with things that are going on in the classroom, kind of break it up, but bring some of those different activities that put them in situations that allow those skills to be developed. I'll echo Rob. Uh, from a Department of Education standpoint, we love career technical student organizations, which include FFA, uh, FBLA, DECA, FCCLA, this BPA uh, and TSA because of the skills you learn as a member. Um, not just showing up to meetings, but taking an active role. If it's participating in a career development event, giving a public speech, uh, you know, participating in public speaking, judging whatever those events are, those help students develop these invaluable skills. I mean, these like ridiculously important skills of being able to communicate with themselves, with peers, and with uh, with business people. So I, I think it's important um, that we participate, and just any bit of participation will help these students. Yeah, exactly. Like like being part of this event today. Okay, our next question is for our industrial leaders. And what are the career pathways that are available to a student who has just a high school diploma but has taken an ad pathway during high school? So maybe in particular to your company, what are those careers? Anybody? Uh, I promise to not say your age. Yeah, for like high school, uh, right out of high school, uh, we have several different positions that uh, you start off as. Uh, 
there's some in the office as a, as a receptionist or a clerk, which may not sound uh, like an ag pathway, but uh, as you, when you talk to farmers for eight hours a day, you know, it is an ag pathway for sure. And um, also uh, our grain receiving, grain grading, which is I guess some of the class, some of the things you guys teach. Um, and then our loadout facility, the loadout areas where we load out product like uh, feed and fuel. Those are the, the entry level positions that all lead to whatever you want it to be. Lead to really, if it's not hard work, and back to those soft skills and how well you do. I mean, it's this is one of those things that's you know competition. Uh, that's why I'm a big fan of sports and schools and, and all those kind of things. Whatever, or whatever, whatever competition you do, because as soon as you graduate, competition continues, and it's, it's even more important because. You're competing against all those other people for a job, uh, no matter where you work. So, and those, like I said, those can all lead to other jobs. Uh, I've had uh, two people in my office, for example, that started off in entry level positions, such as a receptionist or a clerk, and now are commodity traders. Uh, they, they never imagined they walked in the door uh, that they that would lead to that, but they worked hard and did a good job. And even without uh, a four year college degree, they're able to have a career uh, in a high tech company in a high tech industry where they're trading commodities that are uh, impacted by things that go on globally every day. And uh, so uh, you can come, to, come out of high school and, uh, and get a job in a big company like ours and, and lead to a successful career. You know, not a whole lot to add to that, but you know, we look at it in the, this perspective. We, we look at those who come out of high school and want to work on the farm. That's all good, but at the same time, we're going to encourage and we'll use your support financially going on to Ivy Tech, going on to Huntington, getting some working and trying to get that education at the same time because we want to have an employee that, is, that continues to grow throughout their career at our place. So, um, but, but as far as, you know, we got some people we work with. We own part of a company with Google in San Francisco. It's a data science company and I see some guys, folks in there that actually came from high school and they're writing some of these advanced algorithms that we use on our farm today. So. Uh, the college education is really important, and any advanced degrees beyond that's important to us. But you know, at the same time, we're, we open with our arms. We welcome uh, anyone that just comes out of high school and wants to make a choice to, to be a part of agriculture. Because you know, we think there's a lot of opportunities, we want to help them. So uh, we do have roles for them today, but it's it, those roles are it seems like they're diminishing. We have less and less needs for that, so we want to help advance it. First and foremost, I, with the right amount of motivation, um, uh, whether you're coming out of high school or out of college, you, you can achieve a lot, just like uh, <clears throat> a lot of the programmers. Uh, they, they've just learned it through experience, self-taught. Um, so so that, that's the first part. And I work with a lot of internships in college, in, interns in, that are in college and in high school. Uh, and I can tell pretty quick uh, whether they need to be a data programmer by use of phone or be involved in the day-to-day -day activities of, of what we're, we're focused on. So the right amount of motivation and focus, you can achieve a lot. Now, th that goes back to if you, as you're coming out of high school, uh, work with an employee, employees because a lot of times you can fast track that time frame by getting further education, but you can also still work. A lot of those early ones coming out of high school, there's a ton available. More of those are the, the hard skills, the hands-on, and as you, as you adapt and learn what is needed, um, you, you may move up or, or move on for, for something different uh, based off what, what you've learned. But uh, um, a gr there's, there's a lot involved in agriculture, whether it's in the animal science area where, where you're doing hands-on or whether it's agronomy. Um, I know there's a lot of opportunity in the agronomy fertilizer area for, uh, for, for, and it's exciting because a lot of it's done through some sort of data program to understand that information that is gathered out there. In, in the high schoolers, as, as, as they're coming out, a lot of them have been taught that through programs such as FFA, which is uh, still critically important to, to understand. I guess just from watching people in the last 10 years I've been at Creighton's, one thing to keep in mind is there's opportunities everywhere. Um, it's up to you to set yourself apart from that other person. Your motivation is what drives how high you'll go in whatever company you work with. Um, but if you have the, as mentioned earlier, there's so many people out there with the victim attitude that something happened and woe is me, or the world owes me, or whatever else. But 
uh, not to be rude, but your company, they owe you a paycheck. That's what I hired you to do this job. If you want to move on be above that, it's up to you to say, I want to learn more. I want to do more and step up. Um, even when I worked with my family business, so many people said, well, I don't want to do more. You pay me more, I'll do more. And it's, that's not the way the world works. It's um, you do more and show your worth, and then that's how you move up. Uh, the world doesn't really owe any of us anything. Thank you. Okay, another question for our educators. How have post-secondary education opportunities changed for students wanting to pursue agricultural careers? And a sub-question, what opportunities exist for students to get post-secondary credits? If I could have just maybe two people address this Well, all these my personal experience, first of all, how it's changed. I was sharing with several of you earlier about this. I think back to when I was in that blue jacket and when I was considering a career in agriculture growing up on a farm, um, I really didn't know any different. Agriculture is definitely what I was going to go into. I, I love it. Education, I didn't see myself going into right out of the gate. However, I'll tell you this much. Purdue University at the time was the only university, and you've heard several of them, okay? How many of you up here, Purdue grads, okay? So it's it, okay? And we just look in the last couple years. So Ivy Tech has been around actually almost 12 years now. We've only had it at Fort Wayne for four years. Uh, there's seven Ivy Techs that offer agriculture across the state, Fort Wayne, and then the next closest we're here are Marion and Kokomo and, and on South. So keep that in mind. But what's even more exciting to me, so we do a two-year degree, Huntington University has jumped on board. Um, so we definitely have opportunities for students there that can go directly to Huntington University to do a four-year degree, still staying close to home, which is, which is a great advantage for us up here in northeastern Indiana. Um, the second part of your question on, is it careers? Yes, what opportunities exist for students to get uh, post-secondary credits? So what's nice about that, and I touched on this, is particularly Ivy Tech, and I know Purdue, I can't speak for the other universities, but Ivy Tech, we offer eight courses, and I mentioned this on that, that sheet of paper, that students can start taking in high school, and I covered that earlier. Purdue University offers something very similar as well, that they've got courses that students can actually test out of, if that makes sense. We take those on credit transfer too. So definitely lots of opportunities in there for students. But once again, it comes down to, are you willing to take those courses? Are you willing to take that test out exam? What is it that you're willing to do? And it'll pay off in the long run, but you have to make that, that choice. And then that decision to move forward on, it, it might take some extra work and it may not be easy work, but I wish that these opportunities would have been available back when I went through school. Um, for lots of reasons, not only just to be close to the family and farm where I can still work up here, but think about financially. I don't know how many of you are thinking about scholarships or if you have to pay your own way. I paid my own way, and had it not been for my FFA 4-H background and raising livestock and being able to sell, I tell my students I sold off my dairy herd, so I had Holstein heifers. I would sell them off to help pay my way through Purdue University. Now, looking back, my dad gives me a hard time because he says, if you would have kept them, you'd have a great dairy operation. Yeah, well, I also had a bunch of debt to produce, so uh, that was that was my goal to get through here. So, uh, just from the, my perspective, I guess. I, just one thing to add is that um, awarding college credit at the high school level is really important. I'm actually going to let Celia talk a little. Okay. Um, <laughs> well. Um, this, as the state looks at our schools, um, and as students are trying to get diplomas, um, the path to get an academic honors diploma or a technical honors diploma, um, some of the check boxes are dual credit. So that is one of the options and one of the ways they can get that um, diploma. And with the post-secondary and the dual credit, it's important because not only are you alleviating that debt, and like Kelly said, I wish I had that opportunity 20 years ago, but sadly we didn't. But um, I just think of the workload that takes off your parents and you guys uh, just by being able to take that ag animal science class and, and come home with a handful of credits with that. With those honors diplomas, whether you're completing your pathway, uh, which is just basically taking um, a specialized path to graduation through your ag classes, whether it's intro to animal science to advanced animal science, or intro to ag business to power and structure, you complete those pathways as a student, and it's an extra tick for the school and, and, a, and, a, and an accolade for that, but it, it helps you towards that diploma and that graduation. 
Thank you. Our time together has gone so quickly. We have so <laughs> many more questions that we would love to ask our panel, but we don't have time to ask all of them. So I'm going to cut in just a tiny bit into the, the questions from the audience panel and ask everybody to give, I know it's hard, about 30 seconds or less from the industry. What's coming next in agriculture for our community? It was the last question you brought up. So I mentioned this to some of the students over here that were showing their uh, personal protective equipment, and I said, yeah, you know, she is one of the big things that's, that's really affecting agriculture. I think it's going to go towards the farm uh, eventually, and it's already there to some extent, but not enough. I don't mean by this regulation, but we want to save lives, and uh, it breaks my heart every time I see a story about a farmer that was injured or killed in the Grand Van accident or whatever. Uh, she, is, she stands for safety, health, and environment, so I apologize if I'm using acronyms that people don't know about, and you guys do the same thing. So. Um, and that's something that's going to be coming from industry to the farm at some point. And the other thing that's more um, uh, immediate is the, the food safety modernization. It was signed in the law in 2011, but it is now uh, implemented in the industry. And that means, for those of you who don't know, FSMA is another acronym. But what it means is animal feed is now being treated the same as human food. So just imagine what all that means as far as regulation. So that means a lot of jobs in those areas. So to, to impact the, the students here, that's some future jobs, but it's a, a lot of challenges for the community, a lot of cost for our agriculture world. Uh, so I'll pass on to Frank, keep talking. 30 seconds, this is quick. So, <laughs> you know, I'll say this, you know, we don't know what we know, we don't know what we need in 10 years from now. So focus on STEM is critical to us. So I would encourage the educators in this room and from the state to, you know, whatever you can do to advance that. And by golly, keep, keep, Groups like the FFA and 4-H live and active, these are our next leaders. I just came from our national convention last week. We had about 65,000 uh, youth there, about, of an organization of 650,000. We've got 4-H with about five or six million people in it. Uh, I'm a trustee there as well. And I believe in youth development. So anything we can do at our schools, and don't be afraid to lean on us as industry to make sure we can help you with advancing STEM education at your schools to give us somebody that can come out in the workforce that's got a broad set of abilities to problem solve, critical think, and understand science. Yeah, so I talked to a couple people here before I came up here that had been to the FFA convention. Kip was one of them and Keller was the other. Uh, they, they were, just, and I've talked to a couple in the industry, also kids that came back. They were so excited. It, it is exciting what they saw there, what the opportunities that lie, whether it be in data acquisition and animal agriculture, uh, ventilating a barn correctly, or whether it be in the seed industry. There's, there is so much uh, regulation and, and understanding and technical side of it that has to take place from breeding uh, a new corn hybrid to implementing it and getting it, uh, in, in getting it populated to where we can spread it out to the farmers to plant. Uh, that, that there involves a large number of people and a large number of critical thinkers. Uh, and, and it is just exciting to see uh, the FFA and 4-H continue to evolve, uh, and I think that it's critical that we, we, that we keep these activities going as well as STEM to uh, get these soft skills developed so that, uh, that when they're put out in, the, in a career opportunity that, uh, that we're, we're always going to fail at something, but as long as we learn from those failures and move forward in a positive fashion, uh, that's what everybody needs to remember. Here at these guys, they all said it very well. Um, like just the, creating the regulations we all talk about, like we've added jobs just to deal with regulations as they come out. Um, your FDA, your USDA inspectors all go in our chicken houses now. Um, they're west of uh, Warsaw, we're building a new feed mill to deal with the feed part of it because it's just all those regulations that um, do create jobs and we all spend money on it. So. Thanks. I wish we had more time. There's such good questions here, but I do want to give an opportunity for how much time, Rob, for the answer. To well, let's ask. Does anybody has anybody written any questions for the panel? Uh, oh, we have no cards. If anybody has questions, I'll pick them up. Um, so, any questions so far? Because if not, I think we should just go ahead and move forward. If we don't okay. have questions, and then about five till. Yeah. Is that right? That's perfect. Okay. So I have another educated question. I'm going to skip around a little bit from the ones that you saw because there's some ones I really want to know the answers to. Um, 
So what is the career pathway that is attracting the most students, and which pathway do you wish more students would show an interest in? <laughs> I think, uh, and I don't know if this will ever change, uh, but kids like animals. And, uh, guess what? You're not all going to work with animals the rest of your life. Uh, and that's not being me. Uh, it was about five years ago. Uh, a publication came out. I think it was from Pioneer Hybrids. Uh, they had uh, 1,500 jobs that went unfilled because we do not have enough students in the plant, botany, and genetics program. And as the business people over there were saying earlier, we've got to feed all these people. Well, that's where it starts. And it starts with these large ad companies being able to get the genetics to whatever it is that they're producing, 20 more bushels of corn per acre, whatever, that's where it starts. And it's hard, in my mind, it's hard to get kids interested in that side of it because everybody likes fluffy animals. <laughs> I'm going to bounce off of that because, you know, as I've thought about this, it's at our school too. Um, kids have a cat or a dog or a hamster or a goldfish from the time they're three. Kids don't care about plants because they're boring and they don't talk back. Um, kids love video games because they start playing computers and video games. Should I admit that my less than one year old has seen my phone screen? <laughs> you know, um, they, they've dealt with that stuff for a long time. As I try to think of a possible solution, the only thing in my mind that I can come up with is trying to give kids experiences at a younger age. Um, and for schools, that's very hard because it requires another teacher. It requires money to pay a teacher to stay after school and start a garden club, a, a construction club, whatever it might be. Um, and I think I appreciate the businesses that are here because, you know, sitting on the educator side, sometimes it's intimidating to go out there and to talk to, to businesses and ask for help um, and advice. But really, we have to come together to solve this problem and to get more graduates with the soft skills um, and in those interest areas that actually have jobs. And so um, I guess the only thing I'll add is I wish that there were more kids that would be interested in the data um, because there's so much of that in agriculture, but also um, the plant soil science side, just because we need to feed the agrarian world. I would just quickly add, I agree with all of that. I wish more people were interested in the agribusiness pathway. Um, in each of these companies out there, there are people behind the scenes that are lawyers for the ag company. They're in finance for the ag company, sales, marketing, communications. We need all of those things, not just people who can do the actual day-to-day -day production, but we need all the support in those companies as well. And I wish we could attract more students into that. Yeah. I'll play off Rob um, on that again, uh, but I wish we could say, instead of say, I work in marketing, is I work in education, and that just happens to be a marketing aspect. Or I work in data collection, or I work in agriculture, but that's in data collection. I think that's really important that we can we start trying to change that mindset. And we were at an event last week, Rob and I were, and they're talking about their 1,500 jobs within the next five years in agriculture that weren't going to be able to be filled um, because we don't have the people. And I think it's really important that if you have an interest in STEM, you understand that I can go into any sort of STEM, but it's ag-related um, or anything across that board. I also selfishly, um, as a kid, was um, education. Um, we need teachers. Uh, without teachers, without Mariah and Mark and everybody, we're going to run out. Um, and, my, and we're just going to run out of being able to teach these young people, whether it's in an ad class or English. So I think it's really important that if somebody does have that itch to teach, that we encourage them to teach whatever field, whatever subject, because we are going to eventually run out of those educators for K through 12 and even in the preschool level. Okay, last question, and it is one for the educators, but I invite any, anybody from the side of the stage to jump in. Um, I think we're all in this room interested in the answer to this question. In what ways? Um, in what ways does the community currently support your ag education programs, and what are the gaps that the community could come together to help fill? 
There are a lot of people in this room who I recognize and I appreciate. There's Kelly Easterday in the back who is always a phone call away. Um, my administrators who give support to me and the program that I do. And then there's business and industry who I know is willing to help and a lot of times actually they're very good at um, supporting our FFA chapter and our program financially. Um, I think I talked about my vision for the gap that needs filled. Is I have a different standpoint on this, obviously, because I'm a, a, at a college and not a high school. I've been in a high school situation, so I understand where they're coming from as well. So I'll talk about specifically with ID Tech and being in, in the Fort Wayne area. And I had my eyes opened when I first went there, and I was given nothing, I'll be honest. I had to start start with absolutely nothing. Um, so I think the, the big thing is that it takes an equal partnership on both ends. So not only does industry, they don't know necessarily what we need. Um, and we don't necessarily know what, how they can help us sometimes. And so how can we bring them to dig together? So events like this is, is great for me personally, but I've learned over time that it, it takes me to go out and make that initial step and figure out who's out there that maybe I can tap into for resources, not necessarily financial, because um, I, need, I need resources, I need knowledge, I need professionals in the industry that can help educate my students. So that's the approach that I've taken, and I, I feel like I have to continue to move forward trying to find who are these individuals. So I'll give you an example of my address. Just asked me, it's here today, just asked me this morning, do you know any local turf farms in the Fort Wayne area? It's a turf science class. And I'm thinking, oh, I never taught turf science, now I've got to figure out who in the area can we try to, can we try to reach out to and see if they can help educate our students on the turf industry. So that, that would be my recommendation, I think, is how can we bring these two partners, we've got us on each side of the stage, how can we bring this together to where we can figure out what each other needs and then make that happen. Uh, I guess I'm a little different because I've only been at my school for about three months. So I don't know a lot of business people yet. Uh, but uh, I guess that was one of the draws uh, for uh, me to leave my previous job in the kind of typical New Valley uh, was because the large amount of ag businesses uh, that are in the school corporation. Um, which we've already dealt with some, some of my students that are here today, uh, where there was strikers for uh, the ribbon ceremony they had about a month ago. Uh, even things like that are, those are to me good bridges. Uh, the kids are seeing the industry in a whole different perspective than what I could ever teach it in class. Okay? Uh, I think sometimes uh, people think it's all about donating money, like I said, <laughs> and things like that. It is things like that that's going to stick in the kid's mind. Uh, about maybe future employment and opportunities of going to college. Uh, I came with a community with one virtually one ad business in the entire school corporation, with the exception of local farmers. Uh, so what I have here at Tiffany Valley is completely different with many multi-million dollar companies in our backyard. And we've reached out to a, a few of them and we'll do that in the future. At the Department of Education, we are really pushing work-based learning. Uh, so I would encourage the businesses and educators to, to make that connection. Uh, and think about work-based learning as an opportunity to work on your supervised agricultural experience or an internship almost. And I know there's age limit or age and all kinds of other legalities, but that work-based learning will really help a child develop their student, develop their pathway. Um, it may spark that interest of let me go sit in their front office and help with clerical work and all of a sudden it sparks that interest to data or maybe I want to be a seed tester or just, you know, it opens your eyes and I think work based learning is an important, important part of the educational experience. One last thing to kind of add to that is at the state, one of my roles is also to be over at the uh, Alumni Association for the state. And one thing that's kind of unique about the FFA alumni is that alumni doesn't mean that you are an FFA member. Alumni means that you support FFA, whether that's a parent, whether that's a business. Um, anybody can join the FFA alumni. And really, I'd almost love to see that change to just be volunteers, right? FFA volunteers. The job of an ag teacher in running an ag program is huge, and it's a lot of time, and there's all kinds of different things that you could come and volunteer to help um, at the local ag program. I hardly know probably an ag teacher that would be like, no, I'm good, got it. <laughs> um, 
So just being able to offer up that time and talent in those things that you're really good at could really help out um, and, and be a great partnership. Thank you very much, panelists. Can we please show our appreciation for that? I just want to say I'm very impressed with uh, the panelists up here. I'm very thankful for you guys to spend your time to uh, bridge this gap between educators and industry. And I want to offer that the Chamber of Commerce, the Constitutional Chamber of Commerce, is actively in that role of, con of connecting you, your two groups. So think of that, and, and beyond just Kazakhstan County, but all the Chamber of Commerce, and there's other organizations as well, but we are that conduit. We have relationships with industry, so when we can help, please use us as a resource, as a conduit to connect, so that we can have uh, that conversation to continue to grow and to develop so that we can solve the problems that are uh, facing us. We know that uh, there's a big bubble coming uh, as the resources, so we need people who can solve those problems. And so I appreciate, again, your guys' passion and uh, dedication to bringing that forward in the youth that's uh, you're serving. So thank you so much. I do want to uh, let everybody know that on November 29th, we're going to continue this conversation. We're going to have a community conversation 3.0. It'll be held at the Grace, at Grace College, the MOCC. And um, it'll be a great event to be able just to see where we've been in the past as, as a state of Indiana and where do we want to go as a community in Cosasco County. So I invite all of you to attend. You'll be seeing um, registrations come from the, the Chamber of Commerce, but this is in conjunction with many uh, organizations within our community, uh, specifically with the, the Cosasco Community Foundation. Uh, we're partnering together to bring this to you so that we can you know, address the needs. And, and I know some of the needs will be in the aggregate because it is such a big portion of our community and, and our county. Um, lastly, I just want to say thank you to, again, our sponsors of today's event, Horizon Bank, State Farm Insurance, and uh, Kosciuszko County Farm Bureau. I also would like to say thank you to um, Wildlands for the tablecloths and for um, Lakeland Christian Academy for letting us use this awesome venue. Thank you so much. Uh, also to uh, Craig Brothers and Maple Leaf Farms for the foods that run back. And uh, a big thank you to Blue Apron for getting up real early. Uh, I think they were up at 5, 4.35 in the morning to get this prepared so we can have breakfast. And I want to again thank all of you for taking the time out of your day for this important discussion. Thank you.